covering the veteran artists from pop, rock, soul, country, folk, and blues. This is the VVN Music Podcast. Today's program is brought to you by VVN Music. Get the latest news on artists who have been recording for two decades or more every day at vvnmusic.com. Hi, and welcome to episode 14 of the VVN Music Podcast. I'm Roger Wink, and today we're talking with the great entertainer Bobby Rydell. For those who were teens in the late 50s and early 60s, there's no need to introduce Rydell. Between 1959 and 1964, he had 18 top 40 hits, including Wild One, Swing in School, Valari, and Forget Him. But that was only part of the story. At the age of 19, Rydell, who was already a hit on record, branched out to become the youngest person to ever perform at New York's famed Copacabana. Bobby also moved into acting with a starring role in the film adaptation of Bye Bye Birdie and became a favorite guest on variety shows. But all that came crashing down in 2012 when he was facing death before a new kidney and liver were found for him. Today, Bobby has a new lease on life and a brand new autobiography, Teen Idol on the Rocks, A Tale of Two Chances. Sounds like you're in the midst of a whole bunch of media work. Oh, God, I'm telling you, every day it's, you know, phone calls, video things, TV, yada, 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 you know, but, you know, but it's worth it. You know? I was going to say, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Hey, uh, congratulations on the new book. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I did something with the book that I have not done literally in 20 or 30 years, and that's I read it in one sitting. That's how good I thought it was, and it well, kept me know, interested you, the whole time. You know what, Roger? My manager, Dick Fox, uh, we sent him the book, and he said, Bobby, he said, you know, I was only going to read like, you know, 75, 100 pages. He said, I couldn't put it down. I finished the whole book, you know, in one reading. And uh, it, it's a good read. You know, Roger, it's, a, it's really a good read, and it's, uh, it's very honest. It's very sincere. It gets kind of dirty at times, but uh, that's the kind of guy I am. You know, I just wanted the book to be so honest, so truthful, and, uh, and it, came, you know, it came from my heart all these many years, from three years old up until, you know, I'll be 74 in a couple of weeks. It uh, it is it really is a great read and it's it's amazing. I mean, it's interesting to hear the stories behind the hits and so forth, but even more interesting to hear all those things that fans wouldn't have suspected from your life. Absolutely right. I mean, th- th- that was the hard part, you know, uh, talking about specifically my mom, you know. Uh, but I, you know, I said, you know, and uh, you know, everybody who ever met my mom. You know, thought she was the most beautiful, wonderful person in the whole wide world. But, you know, back then, you know, my mom was bipolar. There was no medication, you know, back then, you know, in the the, the mid to late 40s. And she she was two different people. She really was. And uh, to write about her was, was tough. You know, there's no doubt about it. But I figured... You know, if we're going to do a book, let, let's, you know, let's get down to the dirt. Let's get down to the nitty gritty and, you know, let me pour my heart out and, you know, be honest about everything. Well, especially back in the 40s and even up to even five, ten years ago, there was a lot of stigma about bipolar. But I think things are finally starting to change and it's something we can talk about. Well, absolutely. But, you know, back then, you know, like I just said, you know, there, there was no, you know, bipolar what the hell are you talking about you know, medication <laughs> no there was there and my and my mother god rest her soul you know uh, she was born under a great sign she was born under gemini she certainly was two different people hey how did you come to work with uh, alan slutsky because he wrote the book and then did the movie what i consider one of the great documentaries standing in the shadows of motown absolutely well that you know that was the whole nine yards right there i mean alan and i go back i mean he's been playing guitar for me you know back in the 90s for guy you know crying out loud and my wife uh, she said you know after all of these years, people kept saying, Bobby, you have so many great stories. Why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? Oh, come on, write a book. What are you talking about? So my wife was the one who, you know, really, you know, stoked the fire. And I said, well, 
the only guy I can think of to sit down and talk with would be Slutsky. You know, uh, he won the uh, Ralph J. Gleason Award, you know, for best book of the year, uh, the, uh, you know, The Shadows of Motown. And, and, and he's a Grammy Award winner. And, and we're dear, dear friends. So we sat for 18 months. He had a tape recorder. He had a piece of paper, you know, and just and he said, go ahead, Bobby, talk. You know, and he would fire some questions and I would answer them as, you know, as best as I could. And as as much as I could remember, you know all those many years, from three years old, you know, then 71 years later. What struck me in the book is the number of people that stood by your side through everything and and were supporters, and they were for a lifetime. And that started all the way back with your father, who was one of your biggest advocate at the beginning of your career, and, and I guess even bought a set of drums after with the proceeds from cutting it off his finger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my dad, it's in the book, and I'm sure you read it, you know, I was five years old, he took me to see Benny Goodman, because my father was a big band freak, and playing drums for Benny Goodman was Gene Krupa, and I said to my father, I don't know who that guy is, daddy, but I want to be him, and I started playing, you know, I would, I would ruin my grandmother, you know, we're, we're Italian, and I would start, you know, with with uh, uh, spoons and wood, you know, wooden spoons, and I would bang, you know, on the on the pots and pans. And my grandmother would say to my father, "Why don't you go buy him a set of drums?" And you know, we started off at a place called uh, it was on it was a pawn shop, and there was a set called Revere. It, it was a, you know, excuse me, a bullshit set of drums, but it was a set of drums. You know, I think my dad paid maybe, you know, at a pawn shop, maybe $50 for a snare drum, a tom-tom, uh, a bass drum, and uh, a couple of really bad cymbals. And then when my dad, my dad used to work at this place called the Electric, uh, Electronite Carbon Company, and he, was a, he, he worked a punch press, and he lost his finger. And he got uh, something like $3,000, which was like an exorbitant amount of money. You know, back then, I think my dad was making like $40 a week take-home pay, you know. And, you know, he knew how interested I was in drums. And we went to this place called A Street Music Sales. And he bought me my first set of legitimate drums. They were William F. Ludwig Black Oyster Pearl. And I think there's, in the book, there's the, uh, uh, the sales slip. And I think it was something like 500 and some odd dollars, you know, for you know, a fantastic set of drums. And that was back in, oh, in the early 50s. And then, you know, later on in my career, I see the Beatles and I see Ringo playing the same set that I had, you know, like 30 years earlier. <laughs> William F. Ludwig Black Oyster Pearl. Well, five hundred dollars then is like six or eight thousand now. So yeah, oh, those are pretty expensive. It. Oh, oh my God, forget about it. I mean, you can't buy a snare drum. A snare drum alone will cost you three, three fifty, four hundred dollars. You talk about trying to buy Zildjian cymbals or K Zildjian or Stabian or whatever. You know, the cymbals go for a lot of money. So to buy a whole set with cymbals and the accessories, you know, foot pedals and, and sticks and brushes and five hundred dollars. <laughs> you talk about a number of other drummers that that influenced you over time uh yeah Lou, louis belson buddy rich yeah. right any others that were very big in your development of playing drums uh well you know my, the first guy like i said you know was was when i was five and i saw gene krupa and i became so interested you know in drummers you know that later on in years you know uh, I mean, even even like jazz players, like uh, a guy who came here from who came out of Philadelphia, Philly Joe Jones, who worked with Miles Davis on the Milestones album. You know, he's a marvelous player, and uh, you, you can go down the line. You know, as far uh, one of my favorite drummers, and he passed away not all that long ago. His name is Mel Lewis, and he used to have a band at the Village Vanguard in New York City with Mel Lewis and the Thad Jones Big Band, and they called him Mel the Tail. Lewis because his time was impeccable. I mean, if it started at one tempo, it never wavered. You know, one iota. If it started, ding, 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 that's where it ended. Ding, 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 ding. His time was impeccable. And uh, Louis Belson, you know, was the the first guy I ever saw play double bass drums. You know, blah, 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 blah. And and then I became... 
I, I became friendly with. Uh, I, I was I was I, I was on Capitol Records, and I was doing the Milton Berle show. And Milton Berle wrote a song called "You Got to Enjoy Joy," and we went into Capitol Records. And Bob Florence, who was one of the great arrangers, you know, on the West Coast, he wrote the chart. And Louis Belson was playing drums. And it, you know, it starts off with a big band thing. So now, as we, as I get into the song, I'm going, you got to enjoy, joy. You got, and he's playing it on top of the right cymbal. Ding, 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 ding. So, we, you know, we do a take. And I go over to Louis Belson. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Belson. I said, would you mind playing that on a closed hi-hat? You know, just... Instead of ding, ding, ding. He said, is that what you want, Bobby? I said, well, if you don't mind. <laughs> Here I am telling Louis Belson, you know, what, what to play on the goddamn recording. And then Buddy Rich and I became really, really close, extremely close. And Buddy was the type of guy that you can't say, you know, Buddy, you know, what a great drum soul. Wow, man. You know, I, you know, I used to break his balls. I would say, you know, Buddy. You remember that triple paradiddle you played in letter B in bar 48 you know, or the flame of and, and, and that stuff would break him up. I and mean, we, we go to dinner, Italian restaurant. He said, what are you going to eat, Bob? I said, I'll have some, uh, veal scabellini or ravolis, you know, you know, just get, he would just fall down on stuff like that, you know? And the, the one thing, uh, one of his great lines was, you know, when he was sick and he was in the hospital and the nurse came over to him and said, Mr. Rich, is there anything that you're allergic to? And he said, yeah, country and Western music. <laughs> I said, well, that's Buddy Rich, man. You know? I, uh, I went to school with uh, his piano player, Barry Kiner. I don't know if oh, you really? know Barry or not. Yeah. And uh, he used to have some interesting stories. Oh, 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 God, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, there's a lot of stories about Buddy. I'm I'm sure you heard the tape on the bus at one time or another, where he gets he gets involved with this Australian tenor player, and uh, and you know Buddy, you know he was a tough guy. He was really a tough guy. He's you know karate black belt all of this stuff, and he'd beat the shit out of anybody if you didn't you know understand what the hell was going on in the band. You know he would tell he would tell the whole band, listen, I'll get every one of you son of a bitches fired. I'll get a new band tomorrow. You know. If you, 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 he, he was tough, you know, he was really, really tough and a very, very talented guy he sang, he danced, you know, and he was funny. He's a funny guy too. Yeah. I had the he pleasure had a, of seeing he, him a couple of times. Oh, you know, you know, absolute, you know, yeah, what can you say? But like I said, you know, you know, you just can't go, you know, Hey buddy, what a great drum solo. Well, you know, he knows that, <laughs> you know, so you just, you, you just screw with him, you know? The paradiddles, the flaming McHughes, you know, you know, whatever. <laughs> hey, back in the early days of your career, you know, you had three or four, what would best be called more teen oriented hits. And then Correct. right in the middle of that, you got booked into the Copacabana that was a much, right. was kind of considered a high class club. And, you know, would, would go for a, a more jazz or crooners and things like that. How did you go about doing that? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I had two great people who put my act together. There was a guy by the name of Noel Sherman who did all his special material. And another gentleman by the name of Lou Spencer who was originally one of the Dunhills. They were a dance team that used to work with uh, Danny Kay for many, many years. And he kind of like, you know stage the act and you know we put the act together and you know our our goal was the copa cabana so now prior to going into the copa we go to pittsburgh and work the holiday house we'd go to syracuse and work the three rivers in to get all of the you know the bad stuff out and you know let's work on the good stuff and I remember we were doing uh, this nightclub, uh, the Three, Three Rivers Inn in Syracuse. And after the show, and Lou was funny. Lou Spencer was funny. He would have a roll of toilet paper, and he would cut off one sheet of the toilet paper, and he would say, These, this is all you did right. And then he'd roll. <laughs> 
the rest of the toilet paper, and this is all you did wrong. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so by the time we, you know, fine tuned the act, I was ready, you know, for the Copacabana. But you're right. I mean, you, you know, I was I was the youngest guy to ever work there, 19 years old. But you, you look at the people. You know, had Sammy Davis, you had Nat King Cole, you had Sinatra, you know, you had Steve Lawrence, Edie Gourmet, you know, all of, all of the giants of the business. Yeah, yeah, it was was an experience. It really was. Did that also? I believe that happened before you cut both Valari and, and Sway. Did that uh, have an influence on changing the direction of your music? Well, matter of fact, uh, I, I just worked uh, Saturday night the uh, the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City, and uh, it was, I, I was by myself, and we had a sixteen piece orchestra. We had three trumpets, three trombones, five saxophones, piano, bass, drums, rhythm, guitar, and full percussion. And uh, basically, of course, a lot of people want to hear the hits, you know, which included, you know, Wild One, Forget Him, Sway, uh, Volare, uh, Wildwood Days. But interspersed in, in, in that show, you know, Saturday night, I did a lot of songs from the American Songbook. There's one thing that I do in the show that's, uh, uh, well, most of the stuff, most of the stuff in the show when I'm talking about the American Songbook is all related to Mr. Sinatra. And there's one piece of business that I do, and we call it the Saloon Medley. And basically what it is is three songs from Sinatra's Only the Lonely album, which was I think was probably one of the best, you know, ballad albums he ever recorded. And the songs I do there are Angel Lies, What's New, and One for the Road. And, you know, we do other things, you know, uh, uh, for once in my life, uh, you and the night and the music. Uh, 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 I've got the world on a string, you know, so, you know. And, uh, you know, this is stuff that I, I you know, I, I, I wanted to do all of my life, you know. I was never really, you know, into rock and roll because my dad introduced me to big band music at a very early age, five years old. And then I became a big band freak. And I started listening to people like Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Nat King Cole, you know, 10, 12 years old. Then I got into jazz. I started listening to Johnny Coltrane. I started listening to Miles Davis, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, yada, yada, yada. So I was never really a rock and roller. I always wanted to do the American Songbook. And, you know, back then, you know, being so young, I mean, how can you sing songs like Willow Weep for Me? Who's going to you know, believe a 17-year-old kid singing Willow Weep for Me, you know, or Here Comes That Rainy Day? So now, you know, in the twilight of my life, you know, I've lived my life. I know what life is kind of like, know what life is all about right now. And uh, the songs that I sing, you know, are believable to the public now. We'll return to our interview with Bobby Rydell in just a minute. VVN Music is your destination for the latest news on the veteran artists of pop, rock, soul, country, folk, and blues who have been recording for 20 years or more. While the world is transfixed on the latest from Rihanna and Drake, VVN Music concentrates on those artists that have proven to have the talent and stamina to still be active well into their careers. Not only does VVN Music have the latest news, but you'll also find charts from around the world focusing on the performance of these veterans. Flashbacks to earlier days in music, a schedule when artists will be on TV, and a calendar of their upcoming releases. For 10 years, VVN Music has gone where most sites don't, keeping you up to date on the hit makers from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s. That's VVNMusic.com. You mentioned uh, the Frank Sinatra songbook. You recently lost a, a really close friend with Frank Sinatra Jr. Absolutely, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, he was supposed to work a uh, place in Daytona Beach, Florida. It's called the Peabody Auditorium. And I was f following him in the following week. And a very dear friend of his who has been with him for years, his name is Merle. He was an Atlantic City cop, and he also worked for Mr. Sinatra Sr., and, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, it, it was, it was devastating. It really was because Frank, uh, I mean, I, I, I knew Mr. Sinatra. I, you know, I, was, I was in his company a lot of times, you know, but Frank Jr. I spent a lot of time with, you know, and we both appreciated one another's talents. And when he passed, you know, and I, I said, oh my God. And, but Merle was funny because we stayed, 
when I say we, my drummer and me, we stayed at the same hotel that Frank Jr. was in. And Merrill said to me, make sure you don't get room 411. <laughs> That's the room he passed away in. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was tough, but it was, you know, it was like just a moment of levity, you know, you know, uh, because he had been with him for so many years. And, uh, and I, you know, I remember, oh, God, this is quite a while ago, like uh, Frank Jr. Uh, he said, I said, Frank, I, 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 I thank you for so much for, you know, what you said about me. He said, uh, what are you talking about? I said, well, you said something to the effect that he's the best singer out of all of these. And he and Junior said, I never said that. I said, well, no, no I heard it. No, he said, no, not me. It was my father. <laughs> I said, well, that's even better yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, outside of the, the teens and young adults that idolized you you also had a lot of fans like mr sinatra uh in the yeah. the older entertainment ranks and one of them that struck me from the the book was red skelton oh god yeah oh god. I, I did like 12 shows with him you know it was uh, uh televised out of cbs television city in uh, los angeles you know and uh i did uh uh, like I said, 12 shows and Cecil Barker, who was the uh, producer of the show, he says, I understand you do an impersonation of one of Red's characters. I said, yeah, I do Clem Kadiddlehopper and yada, yada, yada. Uh, they wrote a show and, and Cecil told me, you're the only guest who's ever impersonated one of Red's characters. And, you know, Red lost his son, Richard, at a very early age. And he kind of like, you know, I, oh my God, when I did the show, I was 18, 19 years old. And he kind of like took me under his wing, you know, as his son. And he invited me to his home in Palm Springs and his wife, who uh, Red called her Little Red, and she called him Big Red. She said to me, Bobby, I could count on one hand the number of people that Red has had, you know, out to his home here in Palm Springs. We were, yeah, we were very, very close, you know, and uh, I mean, every time I would go see him, I, I'd, I'd cry, you know, because he would do that pantomime, sh you know, stuff, you know. And I, I remember my first wife got rest her soul, Camille, and I took my kids to see Red, my, my daughter Jennifer and, and my son Robert, and he starts doing, you know, the old man watching the parade and saluting the flag. And uh, I'm crying. And my son says to my mother, you know, Mom, what's that crying about? And my wife said, you don't know. It's hard to say. You don't know how much that man meant to your father. Well, from everything I've heard, he really was a, a great man. Oh, he was. He was. I mean, he, I, I mean, the shows. Uh, you know, they used to do a thing, which of course, watching on TV, you never saw. And it was rehearsal, and it was called the Dirty Hour. And he would do things like off of the wall that you know the the crew. If you ever watched the Skeleton Show, and if you remember, you, you, the audience wouldn't be laughing, but you could hear you know, laughter from the crew because they remember what he did at the dirty hour, you know, and then he, you know, he, you know, of course, completely turn it around with a little pregnant pause, you know, reading the script when it was time to tape. And when I, when I played Zeke, I played, he was Clem and I played Zeke at the Lopper and I leave the farm and I go to New York and I become Zeke of Paris and I'm sitting with this really knocked out looking lady and uh, we're having dinner and Red comes in, you know, as Clem and he says, uh, uh, you know, what are you, you know, eating? And I said, well, we're eating wiener schnitzels. And he said, Ooh, I love wiener. Well, at rehearsal, he would say, Oh, I, and he's looking at the girl. He says, I know what you're going to do. You're going to eat his wiener schnitzel. You know, but it never came out that way, you know, on the show, you know, <laughs> but that he, he I, I remember I, I was doing, I, I played that uh, character, Billy the Kid, and I had on chaps, you know, guns, you know, uh, double gun holsters. And as I put my guns into the holster, 
the pants break loose at, to reveal like girls' pantaloons and red and red be coming out, you know, behind, you know, one of the scrims, you know, with a zipper open <laughs> as I'm bending down, you know, trying to pick my pants back up. He was, he was, he, you know, I, I think of all the shows, out, any, out of the 12 shows, I don't think I ever, ever could keep a straight face. I just break up. You know, it was really, it was really hard to get through. <laughs> he must have had the censors just having conniptions, you know. Oh, no, no, but, that, but this was just at the dirty hour, you know. And and he would have, he would have like Gary Moore come in, Carol Burnett, you know, uh, because they were all there at CBS Television City, and uh, everybody knew that Red was going to do the dirty hour. You know, and they would all come in and, of course, lift their ass off, you know. But, you know, when it came time for air, you know, he, he, he kind of stuck to the script. <laughs> so, so, so they could be comfortable, those censors. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you also did a bit of acting. How did it come about that uh, you got the role in Bye Bye Birdie? Uh, my manager at that time was a guy by the name of Frankie Day. And uh, he says... Uh, Got a call from, uh, I, I believe I was with William Morris or GAC at the time. And uh, they said, uh, you, they want you to go out and read for uh, uh, this Hugo Peabody. And I screen tested with Ann Margaret in front of George Sidney, who was the director. And I guess, as you know, basically when you do a screen test, you know, the, the, the cameras are rolling and you more or less talk about yourself. They want to see what kind of personality you have, how you come across on camera. And Ann was there, and then we did a couple of lines from the script, and then we did oh, a couple of lines of one boy, one, one girl, one so so good, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I go home. And uh, two weeks after I get back from L.A., I'm back home in Philadelphia. Frankie Day, my manager, calls me. said, you landed the part of Hugo Peabody. Wow. You know. And I remember seeing the Broadway show, and Hugo Peabody – Never had a line. He he never sang. He never danced. I said, "Well, what you know? What the hell is this? You know?" And every day that I went on the set, George Sidney saw something between Ann Margaret and myself, and my script got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger each day, uh, which proved to be you know the lots of living number, which is you know one of the greatest numbers in the movie. And of course, a lot of lines, you know, as well, uh, with Anne, with Dick Van Dyke, with Paul Lynn, you know, with Maureen Stapleton, you know, and uh, it, it was a great experience in my life, absolutely. We talked about your dad earlier, and then right. you brought up Anne Margaret, and and again, it pointed out to me the number of people who have been friends and and been very close with you. I know that you're still friends with Anne Margaret. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, another name that came up quite often was Linda Farino, who was your fan club, fan club how do your fan right. club, and that was right. from, what, the late 50s, and she still is today? Absolutely, yeah, 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 she's she's absolutely wonderful, she's, you know, been a trooper, you know, she stuck with me, you know, through the good and the bad times, you know, when I started my drinking, I became an alcoholic, basically a, a fall down drunk, you know, is what the hell happened to me. But she never, never, you know, varied. She was always behind me, one thousand percent, to this day. I mean, and uh, her her maiden name is Farino, but she married a Huffman, and my wife is Linda Hoffman. I read that. In so the I got I got I got two Linda Hoffmans in my wife. And, and uh, you know, of course, there was also your very long relationship with your, your first wife, Camille. Cam yeah. And yeah. That, that was just amazing to me because in the world of show business, something like that doesn't happen very often. It has to be I, a I real think, soulmate. I don't think so, right? Yeah, not for 36 years, you know. And uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And she was the one who raised, you know, uh, our kids. You know, of course, I was on the road. You know, I was the guy out there, you know, you know, paying for the groceries, but she was the one who actually raised the kids, you know. And then when I came home and I had time and I'd go to ball games with my son, you know, I'd be a coach. I'd go watch Jennifer play, you know, my daughter. And uh, uh, so 
the little bit of time that I had with my children, you know, through all those years became really, really quality time. And, you know, my kids really appreciate that, you know, and now they're both married. They have grandchildren. I have five grandchildren, you know, and it's, it's just a wonderful relationship. But, you know, going back to Camille, I mean, we kept company for 10 years. I was 15. She was 14. And then we finally got married. I was 26. She was 25. And we had 36 wonderful years. And then, unfortunately, she developed breast cancer. And she was clean for nine years. And we figured, wow, isn't this fantastic? You beat cancer, honey. And then it came back. It came back with a vengeance, you know, through the lymph nodes and so on and so forth. And basically, you know, that's what led to the drinking because a major, major part of my life was gone and I, I, I could not handle it. And my best friend became vodka to the point where, you know, I became a drunk. I became an alcoholic, you know, and that's what led to uh, back in 2012, July 9th, a double transplant, a new liver and a new kidney. I'm a very lucky guy. Yeah, and then also, I think it was a year or two after that, you also went heart had heart surgery, correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah right. I think I'm bionic right now. I got all new parts. And I remember we went to see the cardiologist, and I can't take uh, you know the regular uh, stress test because I also have bone on bone on my knees, so they had to do it with you know needles and so on and so forth, and you know get the heart rate up and so so I go see the cardiologist named Doctor Sokol, and he says Bobby he says uh, you have two arteries, one is eighty five percent, one is ninety five percent blocked, and the ninety five percent block was the LAD, which is the, they call it the widow maker. And I was feeling fine, and I really was. And I said, well, you know what, Doc? This was on a Wednesday. I said, I have to leave for Biloxi tomorrow. I'm working at the casino in Biloxi. I'm flying there tomorrow. He says, you're not going to Biloxi. You're checking in right now. <laughs> and, and that's what led to you know, the double you know, bypass. But now you're feeling well, right? I, I, other than my knees, I feel great. You know? And I, matter of fact, I saw a surgeon at Jefferson Hospital where I had both the transplant and, and, and the double bypass. And he said to me, Bobby, he said, your knees are really, really bad. You're, you're bone on bone. You have nothing, you know, between the car. You're, you're, there's nothing there. He says, but I'm not going to touch you because of your history, you know, with the liver and the kidney and the heart and so on and so forth. And he said, God forbid you get some kind of an infection. He said, now you may want to go to another doctor who may want to do the surgery. And I said, after what you just told me, I said, I'll live with, you know, get the needles, get the cortisone shots, you know, right in the knee. And so, you know, I said, yeah. I, listen, I, I know that we were scheduled for half an hour and we're run over a little bit. I just wanted no to problem. ask you, what what's up next for you? I know you're probably promoting the book, but uh, what else is yeah. on the horizon? Uh, well, I, you know, I, uh, you're probably not aware of this. I, I think it's just a couple of months ago, I got an email from, uh, I don't know how it got to me or it got to Linda Hoffman, meaning my fan club president, but, uh, Taylor Hackford, the director who did idol maker and, uh, officer and a gentleman, the Ray Charles movie and yada, yada, yada. He's doing this. He, he's directing this new, new movie with Robert De Niro, and it's Robert's new movie called the uh, the Comedian, which has been something that De Niro has wanted to do for God knows how many years. I was going to say and, that sounds familiar. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's due to come out like either late 2016 or early 2017, and the whole thing takes place at a autograph section. And Taylor Hackford, uh, he says, I want Bobby Rydell to be there, the, you know, to take part in this autograph convention. And so I said, wow, you know, I mean, just the fact of meeting De Niro would have been enough, you know. And I go on and make up, and uh, Taylor Hackford comes over, and he says, Bobby, uh, Taylor Hackford. I said, my pleasure, Mr. Hackford. He says, I'm a very big fan. I said, well, gee, that's that's really nice to know. He says, you know the scene, don't you? I say, yeah, it's an autograph convention. I'm sitting next to Mr. De Niro and so on and so forth. He said, yeah, that's basically it. You know, he says, but once we get on the set, 
you know, I may, I may have some ideas. Lo and behold, I got a little cameo with De Niro. I got like four or five lines with him, which was you know, phenomenal. You know, just great. You know, that's great. And yeah, the, the basic thing. He was one. Uh, the, the movie. His name in the movie is Jackie, and he had this sitcom, which was sort of like an all, all in the family. And then the show went off the air. Now he wants to become a stand-up comedian, like a Don Rickles, and he's never been at an autograph convention, and that's what happens between him and me because. He goes berserk. He goes berserk at this uh, autograph convention. And he, uh, he, I mean, you know, like when I first met him, uh, I was sitting behind the table and he came out. He says, Bobby, Robert De Niro. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, my pleasure, Mr. De Niro. And he said, uh, and he talked so soft. He said, uh, what are you doing now, Bobby? You got your own production company? Uh, I said, no, Robert. I said, still singing he said oh that's good that's good you know so and he was so sweet and now there's one part in the movie where he goes into De Niro and there's some of them and then all this shit and then he calls me and this is the scene he calls me over he go, and I play myself in the movie he says Bobby and as I'm walking over I'm laughing because he just went berserk and I walk up to him and I, I go I'm laughing I'm going yeah what, what, what do you want, Jackie? He says, I've never done this before. And I said, yeah, I kind of figured because he just goes berserk, you know? And and, and, I, and I, I just tell him, look, Jackie, you know, the people come up to you, you say hello, they say hello, you sign a picture. I tap him on the shoulder and I say, look, Jackie, just be yourself. You know what I'm talking about? Just be yourself. And that's it. You know, but I was, you know, as far as I knew, I was just going to be on the set. He was going to be on my right, and I was going to be signing autographs, but now I got lines with the guy. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you know, yeah. De-, De Niro was known for many years to be the worst interview for talk shows. He used to give right? one-word answers and things like that, but in his well, older thought, years, yeah. he has really come out of his shell. Oh, you know, I mean, you know, when we were, you know, doing the, you know, we had no script. It was just, you know, off the top of our heads, the lines that I just told you. And I turned to him and I said, uh, I said, Robert, is everything okay? You know, am I reading everything good for you? You know, and he'd look at me and go, hey, yeah, but don't worry about it. Everything's fine. <laughs> you know, so laid back for Christ's sake. And then when he goes on the set and he starts going with the fish, son of a, <laughs> I said, Jesus Christ, you know. <laughs> Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us on on the new book, and I wish you all the luck with it. Thank you ever so much. I really appreciate it, Raj. Thank you, buddy. Our thanks to Bobby Rydell for talking with us. We'll be back soon with more editions of the VVN Music Podcast with guests like Canadian metal queen Lee Aaron and guitarist Michael Schenker. Remember that you can get the latest news on the veteran artists of rock, pop, soul, country, folk, and blues at vvnmusic.com, where you can also find back editions of our podcast with guests like Nils Lofgren, Steve Hackett, John Anderson, Marky Ramone, and Lloyd Price. If you have any comments or questions about the website or this podcast, please send them to vvnnetwork at gmail.com. Our theme music is performed by Yahar. This program was recorded on May 12, 2016, and is a production of the VVN Network, copyright 2016.